Uh, we're going to do this presentation. We have about an hour long presentation. We have to do it in about 35 minutes, so we're going to try to go as fast as possible. A lot of the presentation is going to be demo, so it's all live demo. Well, 90% live demo, we have a little bit of recording. Uh, so today, uh, my name is Dan Walsh. I am a, uh, a longtime Red Hat employee, uh, and I'm in charge of the container team, container runtime team at Red Hat. Basically, we do everything that is underneath Kubernetes, everything that runs underneath Kubernetes on a host, as well as other container runtimes. Yeah, yeah, it won't, it won't happen. And Ronald is, tell Hi. Uh, so I'm a cryo maintainer, OCI maintainer, run C maintainer, primarily focusing on cryo for the past couple of years. Okay. So the name of this talk was actually security considerations for container runtimes, but I actually like to talk about it differently. It's, just, it's really, we're talking about container engines here. There's, one of the problems in the container world is that we have these overlapping terms. So a lot of people call these things, they call Docker a container runtime. Um, but really, all these things are engines. When I'm talking about engine, it's the thing that actually pulls images to a host, executes containers on top of it, but usually container engines are actually launching OCI runtimes underneath. So we're gonna go through all that today um, and show you some runtimes running underneath. So really think of think things like Docker, Cryo, um, Podman, uh, build a container D, they're all container engines. And then runtimes are the things underneath. So we're talking about things like Kata containers, uh, Run C containers, Gvisor, um, Nabla, and a host of others. Uh, I guess uh, one was announced by AWS this week called Fly um, um, oh, Firecracker. Um, so anyways, if anybody's done this, I, I like to do an interactive with my crowd, so let's go stand up, everybody. Everybody, ah, stretch your legs a little bit, all right, ready? <laughs> Please read out loud all text in. Excellent, excellent, okay. So contain containers are more than just this, uh, just Docker, right? Docker sort of revolu revolutionized this thing, but containers are much more. They're really a Linux concept, um, and we're going to go through that. But let's look at what it means to run a container on a system. What, what, do, you, what do you have to do to run a container? Um, so really, when I looked at Docker years ago, and I've been working on Docker pretty much, you know, not since the beginning, but since it really exploded onto the scene. Um, what Docker does is it does multiple different things. It handles multiple different kinds of workloads. Um, and really, in, in some ways, didn't follow what sort of the traditional Unix model where you, you do individual you know, tools to do individual tasks and then do them well. Um, so really what we wanted to do is to break apart sort of what Docker is doing and try to figure out different ways of doing uh, some of those functions. And of course, since I'm from Red Hat, we have to insert the systemd joke at this point. <laughs> Okay, so we'll get that out of the way. So yeah, don't ask me what about system D. Uh, so we want a separate use case. There's separate container use cases. When, when we're dealing with containers, we have separate ways we want to deal with containers. And I, I break them down to three main uh, use cases. Um, the one I push the hardest is containers in production. So most of the people that came to come to this conference are here for Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is all about running containers in production, right? It's not about developing containers. It's not about playing with containers. It's running containers in production. It's really moving them out. And the security goals of running containers in production is much different than developing containers or even building containers. So the second use case for containers is building container images. So when I want to build a container image, build an image that I'm going to push to a container registry, that requires more privileges than running a container in production. Okay, so because I'm actually writing to the images, writing content into the image store. Lastly, there's developing and playing and sort of getting familiar with what it means to be a container. Okay, so just playing around with the container, and that's a different use case as well. All right, so the, what we wanted to do is we wanted to build tools for those three different use cases and not basically lump them all together. 
So when we looked at it, you know, we're here for, mainly for a Kubernetes conference. What does Kubernetes need to do to run a container? So the first thing Kubernetes needs to do to run a container is identify what the hell a container is. Right? We have this, what is a container? So a container really means a container image. Right? So people say, I want to run the Nginx container, or I want to run the uh, you know, Fedora container, or the uh, HTTPD container. And what we needed to do is have a definition of what a container is. And this is really what Docker invented. So Docker invented the idea of a container image. Right? It was basically a tarball and some JSON files that describes what's inside the tarball. Really, it's a root FS that I put content into this thing, a directory on my system that sort of looks like Slash. I put content into it, and then I create a JSON file that describes it, what's the entry point, what environmental variables, and that's really what a container image is. And what we needed is we needed a standard to define what goes in that JSON file. So early on in the container process, when Docker came out, we need, you know, Docker basically owned the standard. And this history of that being a problem when one company owns a standard, right, or a de facto standard. And the problem is it's called Microsoft. Well, most of us Linux guys like Microsoft now, but back in the bad old days, Microsoft owned .doc. And every time they released a new version of, Open, of Office, is they changed .doc format. And so everybody that was trying to build tools to deal with .doc would suddenly be broken. So what we needed to do is get a standard and, and get a standard on it, um, standards bodies together to do that. CoreOS came along before Red Hat acquired them, and they said, we're gonna generate a specification. And they generated a specification for what they defined as a container. And they generated the AppC spec. The AppC spec came along, and suddenly we had two ways of doing containers. We had Docker containers and we had AppC containers. And what happened is a bunch of companies got together at that point and said, we have to have a standard. We can't have Debian and, and RPM again, right? 20 years, 25 years ago, Debian and RPM, Red Hat and, and other open source developers couldn't get together on a standard what it meant to package software on Linux, so we ended up with two formats. So anybody who wants to ship software in, in Linux has to ship it in two formats. So the companies that got together were Google, Microsoft, Red Hat, IBM, CoreOS, might be the same company at some point. Uh, 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 Docker and a few others, and I always forget the others, and if they're in the room, they can shout out what, but basically they got together and created OCI. So OCI image specification, bundle specification came out a year ago, and that basically says this is what it means to be a container image, and those container images consider the container registries. So the next thing you need to do after you define what a container is, you have to get it off of the registry to the host. And we developed a tool several years ago called Scopio. And Scopio was meant, meant remote viewing, and basically it was a tool to look at container images. Eventually that evolved into a tool that could pull images off of the host back and forth. Well, CoreOS a year ago, a year and a half ago, came to us and said, we want to use Scopio to pull in container images for Rocket to use. But they said they didn't want to execute the Scopio command. They wanted us to create a separate library, so a CLI on top of um, a Scopio split into a, CL, a library in a separate executable, and so we create a containers image. So containers image is a full library, Go library, that can be used for pulling and pushing images from container registries. The next thing you need to do after you pull the image to the host is the image usually comes in a bunch of layers. So I need to be able to take those layers, so that image bundle, and untar it onto my system. So I need to untar onto several different, well, the way we do it is we do it with a layered file system called a copy on write file system. So if you played with Docker, you've seen overlay, device mapper. So we have, we have a library out there that actually was, you know, originally, a lot of it was written by Red Hat. Some of it came from Docker and other people. It's called container storage. And what's inside a container storage is overlay driver, AUFS driver, uh, XFS, ButterFS, device mapper, and VFS, I believe are the, the ones. So basically we have a library that can be used to store container images onto a host. The last thing you need to do, is, you know, so basically I have the ability to identify a container, I have the ability to pull a container image off a container registry, I have the ability to store it on disk, now I have to execute the container. So the last thing was done was the OCI standard for runtime. So we defined, OCI got together and defined what it means to be a runtime. So when I run a container, I have three people that participate in defining what it means to run the container. First of all, I have the container image that has that JSON file associated with right? the image bundle spec. The second thing I have is the container engine. It has sort of hard-coded 
constants inside of it that it defines to run a container. And lastly, I have the user or the, you know, like Kubernetes or something like that that's talking to the container engine and said, I don't want to use the defaults, I want to use these sub sub separate other things. What the container engine then does is it takes the input from the image, its own hard-coded image uh, content, and the content from the user, combines it all together and, and writes a JSON file. That JSON file is what the image specification is. Then there's a tool that can run that, read that image, read that JSON file, which points to the root FS that was created on the copy on write file system, and it starts to execute the container. Basically, it configures the kernel to set up the container and run PID1. Run C was, uh, actually came out of lib, um, lib container, which was donated to the OCI by Docker, and then we built a tool, and, and sadly, it continues to be developed for all these years, a year and a half, two, two or three years later, and it's continued, still isn't 1.0, but pretty much everybody in the world that runs containers right now, sort of the tr traditional containers is using Run C. Docker uses it, Cryo, all the tools we're gonna be talking about today, um, all use Run C. There's other OCI runtimes that have come along, like Kata containers, uh, GVISE, or those other ones that I talked about earlier, have all implemented OCI. All they do is read the specification, and then they launch a container. Everybody got it so far? So the last step of what Kubernetes needed to run a container is also triggered by CoreOS. So CoreOS, sadly, all this happened before CoreOS got bought by Red Hat, by the way, so congratulations to CoreOS. So CoreOS came along, and they wanted, they had Rocket. And what they did is they came to Kubernetes and said, we want to run Rocket under Kubernetes. And at the time, Kubernetes, this is three, three years ago or so, at the time, all Kubernetes did is call out to the Docker API. All they did is talk to Docker. So CoreOS team got together and they wrote a huge patch set that came to Kubernetes and said, if def Docker do it this way, else def do it Rocket's way. And the Kubernetes developers, teams, basically at that point said, hold on, you know, the Piv uh, Pivotal's gonna come and they're gonna say, if def ge gear, do it this way, right? And so they didn't want to have all these different container engines sort of specifying what it meant to run a container out of Kubernetes. And they turned it on its ear and said, instead of you guys coming to us and embedding your, you know, secret sauce into us, we will call out an API to you to run a container. And that was called a CRI, Container Runtime Interface. So the uh, container runtime interface was developed by, uh, by uh, Kubernetes team, and at that point, one of the members of my team, Marlo Patel, came to me and said, hey, we can build one of those. Right, uh, so Cryo. What is Cryo? Cryo basically loves Kubernetes. So Cryo's only purpose is to implement the Kubernetes uh, CRI interface. Nothing more and nothing less. Doesn't care about Mesosphere, doesn't care about anything else. So it, it loves Kubernetes, basically. Uh, so Dan talked about all these pieces that we used to, to make up the container runtime. And let's see what a Kubernetes node looks like when we're using Cryo as a runtime. So on the left, here you see the kubelet. And on the right is the Cryo daemon. And the gRPC API is basically the CRI which is implemented by the Cryo daemon. And Kubelet is using the client side of that API to talk to Cryo to, to create and run images. So CRI comprises of the image service and the runtime service. And the image service is basically responsible for pulling down images. So Kubelet basically asks over CRI, hey, pull this image, because the container I'm going to launch is going to need that. And we use the container's image library to implement the image service. And the runtime service uses, uh, takes that image and uses the storage library to create the copy and write file system using like overlay or device mapper or whatever, the, whatever it is configured to use as a driver. And then it uses another OCI library called the OCI generate library. It basically uh, takes all the CRI configuration and converts it into a JSON that, that is the OCI uh, runtime spec uh, JSON, so RunC can understand it. And uh, for networking, we have been using CNI. So any plugin that is CNI compatible can be used with Cryo. You just write down the CNI config and it'll pick Flannel or Calico or any other CNI solution. And then finally, for the runtime, um, today it calls out to any OCI compatible runtime. So if you have a path to your OCI binary, by default it's RunC. 
but we also added support uh, for Kata working with Intel. So we have support for both of those and any other, uh, I think even Gvisor works through that interface. And on top, you see a couple of pods running. And so what actually makes up a pod? Um, so if you're talking Run-C, we have an infra container, which is kind of the holder container for, uh, for the C groups and all the shared namespaces between the containers running in the pod. So you, when, you, when, you, uh, when Kubelet says start a sandbox, we launch that infra container. And then when it asks us to create containers inside that pod, those containers come and join the namespaces of the pod. And they are all run under the C group slice that is assigned to that pod. So they are kind of contained inside that pod. And then on the right, you see one more little thing called Conmon. Now, what is Conmon? So we wanted to design a cryo from the beginning uh, to be able to like restart cryo without taking down the containers that are started by cryo. So Conmon is a small program written in C, and it stands uh, this, uh, for co like container monitoring. So what it's doing is it's basically watching the container process, and it's uh, it just records when it exits it. And it, it can, so it can return the exit code back to the kubelet. In addition, it's also responsible for all the logging needs. So CRI defines a logging format, and Conmon is responsible for reading the logs from the, that the container process is spewing out and writing them out in the CRI format. It is also responsible for handling like attach, exec, and oom events. However, like Conmon, I mean, you see so many Conmon processes running. So for efficiency, we have written Conmon using C and shared libraries. So your memory usage overall, even if you spawn hundreds of containers, shouldn't be a lot. So what's the status of Cryo? So we have like nine test suites passing on each uh, PR, like more than 1,000 tests, and no pull request is merged without running all these tests, including Kubernetes end-to-end -end tests. So all the branches, all the PRs that go in there are always passing the Kubernetes tests. Right now, we are supporting versions 110 through 113. So we said, like, Cryo loves Kubernetes, right? So can you guess what version of Cryo works with what version of Kube? Very simple. You just take 110 for Kube 110, 111 for Kube 111, and 113 for Kube 113, which was just released last week. And uh, one more additional point, so OpenShift 4.0, which is Red Hat's uh, world distribution of Kubernetes, is uh, going to use Cryo by default for 4.0. It's already available as a preview. You can try it out it's using Cryo. And also OpenShift Online is using Cryo in production today. So now I'm going to demonstrate a few security-focused features that we have added to Cryo. So here I have the cryo daemon running. And here I have set a local uh, Kubernetes cluster that is talking to the cryo socket. Let's do a get nodes. And you see we are using cube 113.1. Uh, let's start a simple web application which just returns a hello 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 open ship string so it's already started so you can see that it's running let's see if it if we can actually hit it yep so it's up and running now I'm going to start another container. And oh, sorry. So this is an interactive container, and it's using the attach API. So you get an interactive shell here. Now let's jump to the cryo configuration for a second. So this is a cryo configuration file where you set up the cryo daemon. This is the part to the socket, for example. And right now, we care about 
the capabilities. So if you take a look at the capabilities here, it's the list is a lot shorter than what Docker does by default. And the reason is, like, Cryo is configured to run containers in production. It, it doesn't support builds, a lot of other things that Docker does by default. So that's why we have been able to uh, trim down this list. And like, it can be trimmed down even further if you can figure out what capabilities your containers aren't going to need. So one thing to note here is that we don't have cap net raw. Now let's go to our container and see what capabilities we have. So you can see that the list here matches what we saw in the config. And now, remember that we don't, we don't have kept net raw. Now let's see if we can actually ping this other part that we started earlier. Yes, we can. So if anyone knows, like, ping requires cap net raw, how are we still able to ping the other container, right? So we are taking advantage of a new kernel feature that was added. So basically, it's a syscuttle that you can enable that allows you to use ping and without having cap net raw. The advantage is like cap net raw has been involved in many security issues over the years. And if you give it to your containers, they have the ability to craft packages and potentially cause security issues. So Cryo allows you to like set default syscuttles, remove capabilities at the daemon level, so all your containers are more default, are more secure by default. Uh, let's take a look at one more thing. So let's see if I can actually write or touch any files. So uh, uh, I cannot, and why is that? Well, I made use of another feature here which is called read only equal to true. So what this means is all of my containers are running with no writable top layer. So if you're, if, if, you're, if you're giving a writable top layer to your containers, they can end up writing content over there and end up using this space, which you would want to save. So if, if you craft, if you write your containers well, then the containers should be designed in such a way that they are only writing to bind mounts that you provide to the container. So in case of Kubernetes, you would, you would be using the appropriate mount, like an empty dir or a persistent volume or something like that. So Cryo allows you to like enable read-only, just like how, how one more tenet of being secure is never run any container as root. So this is a security feature similar to that. One, so anyone know fork bombs? So the kernel added a feature a couple of years ago, uh, as basically a C group for limiting the number of PIDs that are allowed within a C group. And uh, let's see if we can fork bomb uh, this container. So what I've done here is cryo exposes a PIDs limit setting, and that is applied to each container started by cryo. And basically, this says that you cannot start more than 50 processes in, inside your container. And let's see how this maps to a value that you can see inside your pod. So you can see the limit is 50. Now I'm going to try and start 60 processes and see if that actually works. So you can see that 49 plus the shell itself makes up the 50. And after that, the kernel stops you from creating any more uh, processes. So this is one more setting that Cryo provides out of the box. And you can just use it to make your containers more secure. So earlier, we talked about Kata. And our friends of Intel have created this nice little demo for us. And so Kubernetes recently add, added a feature called runtime class. And what runtime class does is it is allows you to configure multiple runtimes. And it allows, you, uh, allows a way for you to pick the runtime in your pod YAML. Say, for example, if you want more security for a particular pod, then you would say I want, you would want to run that in a VM-based container like Kata. So, that's what 
uh, this feature does. So I'll try to, this is a long presentation and we'll give the link in the, in the presentation if you want to see the entirety. I, I would highly recommend going through all of it, but because we don't have time, I'll just jump to the relevant parts for now. So, okay, uh, so here, Cryo is configured to support two runtimes, Run C as well as Kata, and you give path to both the runtimes. The default runtime is Run C, and the other one is Kata. Then we jump ahead. And you can see a custom resource definition is created for runtime class, and then another one is created for Kata. So now the cluster understands there's this another type of runtime called Kata. Then we launch a default pod using RunC. There's no runtime class added to this pod definition here. Just jumping ahead a little bit. So the default pod is running. Then we check and run see that the more containers running. There were 17 earlier, there are 19 now. Uh, one for uh, the post infra container and one for the actual container. And then uh, we see that there's nothing running under Kata containers right now. Then we create a pod YAML for Kata, and the thing to note here is the runtime class is set to Kata. So this basically tells Cryo that when you see this pod, take a look at the runtime class and use Kata instead of RunC to spawn that pod. So now the Kata pod is started. Nothing got added to run C, but you see two containers running under Kata. Okay. So, so the whole presentation goes over how to set this up entirely. So if you have interested in details, please check it out. Jump back. Okay. Jump back. Okay. Yep. Cool. okay, so that was um, basically cryo. Now we're going to be talking about Podman. So one of the, uh, originally I talked about the three ways you want to run containers. Well, one of them was running in production, as we just saw. We can take advantage of a lot of security features that aren't available when I want to sort of play and test with a container. So now we're going to look at what you want to do when you want to test and play with a container. And we introduced a, 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 a new project called Podman about a year and a half ago. And we call it part of the LivePod project. But basically, Podman stands for a pod manager. But really what we wanted to do is we wanted to replace Docker CLI. So this is a di different presentation I give sometimes called replacing Docker with, uh, d replacing Docker with, oh God, you're falling asleep out there. <laughs> okay, so this is what you do. You do a DNF install, Podman. Then you do alias Docker equals Podman. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> But we'll hold off questions to the end, okay? <laughs> so, and, and the way I can prove that that's true here is, uh, this was uh, my favorite tweet all time. Uh, this is Alan Moran, who I don't know. I uh, said, I completely forgot that two months ago I set up an alias of Dr. Eagles Podman. And by the way, this happened in May. And it has been a dream. And then he says, no big fat demons, which is my mon mantra. Um, and down here, someone responded to him and said, how did you figure out that you were running, uh, weren't running Docker? And he said he ran Docker help. And of course, Podman help came up. So let's jump and I'll give a quick demo um, to uh, show you all the security features that are in Podman. So first of all, that's for Ronald's password when you're at a pseudo. Uh, okay, so <laughs> the, the first thing we're gonna do here is uh, just show you Podman version. So pretty much looks like Docker version, Podman info. 
Now the interesting thing here, Podman info, pretty much like Docker info, except that unlike Docker, we did not want to lock you into Docker IO. So we wanted to allow you to customize and pick which registries you want to have in your environment. So if out of the box, this is a Fedora system, so we have Docker IO, Fedora Project.io, Quay.io, Red Hats, and CentOS's uh, um, registry. So if you give a just, you know, I want to run Nginx, it'll go through the list of registries and ask. If you want to set up your own registry and, and remove all these registries, you can do that. You can do whatever you want with the uh, configuration of, of this tool, right? It's, um, so it's, it's any registry. So one of the things we talked about is building containers, right? So we talked about building containers as a third way. Well, I, we're not going to have time to actually show you Builder today, but we're actually running Builder right now. But what we're actually doing is we're running a container with Builder inside of it. And then we're using Builder inside of a container to build a container. Okay, and that's a lovely way, way of, you know. So we're actually just built, up, up above we had a Docker file that actually had the three lines of, uh, um, oops, keep going up a little bit more. Basically it pulled Alpine, set up a couple, an environmental variable and a label, um, and actually created an image um, inside of a container. Now what that really demonstrates is using this tool, there are no demons, right? There's no reason to have a demon. It's just a st standard fork and exec process for running a container underneath it. Um, and we can actually build containers inside of containers without leaking the Docker socket into containers. And by the way, access to the Docker socket means you have full root on the host and there's no logging to track what you do. Um, so now we are actually gonna, uh, uh, basically run the container and show you that we have uh, actually, so here is the container image that we built um, on the system. So we built an Alpine image and we, or we pulled Alpine image and then we built it. Now we're just going to remove and clean it up. Okay, so pretty much Docker can do that, right? You know, somewhat everybody's seen Docker do that. What I'm about to show now is something that Docker can't do. We're actually going to run the entire CLI as non-root. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to, well, he's already done it, so he pulled the Alpine image as non-root. So if you looked up above, these podman commands used to say sudo, and now they're not saying sudo. He just ran an Alpine ls command inside of a container, and now he's going to list all the containers that we've written previously. All this stuff's happening in the home directory, right? This is podman running inside the home directory. When I present to customers, customers are always asking me, should I allow Docker Socket to be leaked? All the developers want to run with Docker Socket. And I say Docker Socket is worse than giving sudo with no password. At least sudo with no password has logging, okay? And when I say that, everybody say Docker has logging. Yes, and I, if I have access to Docker Socket, do all my stuff and then I destroy the, log, the container and I destroy the log at, the, at that time. Um, so if I do podman images, you'll notice that I have two images inside of my home directory, but now if I do sudo podman images, you'll see that I have a whole bunch of them. Now that shows that there's a separation, root images versus uh, user, uh, user directory images. And that means that every user is gonna have his own store inside of his own home directory, and that way they're isolated from each other. That's taking advantage of the user namespace. Now, if you come to the pot, if you want to see a demonstration of using Namespace, it takes too long right now. I'll be at the uh, Red Hat booth afterwards and I can show you some of this stuff. But all this is taking advantage of using Namespace to be able to do this functionality. But using Namespace is actually even better than that. Using Namespace means I can map non root users to root inside of a container. So here we are demonstrating we're going to create a container. Now we're going back to root and we're going to uh, create a container that maps zero to 100,000 and then the first 5,000 UIDs after it. So I'm mapping 5,000 UIDs starting at zero inside of the container, and this, they're actually UID 100,000. So one other thing we added to Podman is we added the ability to actually, uh, Podman top now has the ability to reveal what's going on inside of a container. So here we have user and host user. So it shows you that you're running as root and UID 100,000. The next line we did is like rep, uh, we did basically just a standard PS command, and it shows that that container, even though it's running in a user namespace, is running as 100,000 on the host. Now we run a second container as 200,000, and we're gonna see that's running as root in 200,000. Now we're gonna do the PS command, and that, you can see now, is running at 200,000. So we have two processes running in container. They both think they're root, but if they break out of the container, they would be treated as UID 100,000, UID 200,000. Now, this is user namespace, but it's never been used anywhere. Okay, user namespace is available inside of Docker right now, but it's a single user namespace for the entire all container runtimes. 
All right, it's not even used in cryo yet, and that's mainly because Kubernetes is behind in being able to handle it if we put it in user namespace. But we're doing it in Podman, we're experimenting. We're also working with the Linux kernel guys to make this fast, to make it as fast as possible as far as uh, handling it. So another interesting thing about Podman versus Docker is Docker is a client server operation. That means that basically when you run the Docker client, the container is not a child of your process, it's a child of the container daemon. Podman is different in that it is a fork and exec model. So the process, the ch container, is actually a child of your process. How many people in here have ever heard of login UID? Uh, some of you care about security. The all the hands should have gone up. It's a really cool security feature. When a user logs into a Linux system, login UID is recorded. The, the login program basically says, this process was started by Dan Walsh, or in this case, I'm Ronald. So you can see that when I log it, the process is running as 1,000. Now we're going to run sudo, become root, execute podman, which is going to execute a container, and then we're going to look at the, Etsy, the, the login UID. OK, so it comes out as 1,000, right? Now we do the exact same command with Docker. And Docker comes out as this really huge number, which stands for minus 1 in the 64 bits. OK, so this means that the Docker daemon was never set, right? It wasn't created by a user process and never logged in. So it ran the container as that. So why is that important? Let's look at the auditing subsystem. So this command here basically says, I'm going to watch Etsy Shadow. OK, it's going to watch for anybody modifying Etsy Shadow. And we're going to break out of our container. We're going to run Podman and actually modify Etsy Shadow. We're doing a touch of Etsy Shadow. Now let's look at the audit log. It says right here that this evil human being up here just hacked the system, OK? <laughs> and then he did something weird on that keyboard. OK, so Ronald basically has modified that. So now we just ran Docker, the exact same breakout of Docker, and now we're going to see what happens when Docker does it. And it comes up with an AUID is unset. So if a container breaks out of Docker and affects the system, you have no idea who created the container to do that, whereas Podman is. So it's just a way to think about um, what's happening versus a client server model versus a fork and exec model. Let's go to next. So other features. So containers, if you've ever seen me talk about containers, I always talk about all these security features that are involved in containers. And a lot of it's like me waving my hands and said, Dan Walsh said this stuff happens. So we added to Podman Top the ability to actually reveal what's going on inside the container and basically the security features. So the first one is we now have a PID and an HPID. So PID tells you the PID of the container. And then HPID tells you the process on the system. So the next one we're going to show is actually showing you the SC Linux label. So this top is showing you all the processes and what SC Linux label is associated. This one's showing you a set comp. It tells you whether or not set comp is turned on or not in the system. And the last one, remember Mano was talking about capabilities? So Linux capabilities, the ability to break root into multiple different, um, you know, the power of root down into different things. So we actually go with, because we're trying to modify, you know, mimic what Docker does, this is the list of capabilities they did. So if you saw in his presentation, there's about eight capabilities. But when I'm playing with containers, I actually have a lot more. So for instance, I have make node because I might want to do a build. I might want to create device nodes. I have uh, as uh, net raw, right? Because um, I might want to ping and I might not have that, K that syscall, syscontrol set. So there's a bunch of these things that don't, you know, I have auto write. I don't know why auto writes on at all. But anyways, that's the list of capabilities that no one knows. They're hard coded into the Docker daemon, right? So this basically shows you what's going on. So Podman stands for pods, pod manager. Well, pod is a concept from, Linux, uh, from Kubernetes that basically allows you to run one or more containers inside of Right, inside of a pod or a group, of, basically the group your containers together inside of the same namespace. So Podman actually manages not only containers but also pods. So here we are, we just created a new pod called Pod Test, and we're going to create two containers inside of it. So we join the two containers, and you can see that there's no containers running on my system right now. So I'm going to actually start the pod test, and boom, two containers are running. So basically, we're showing that containers are tied to the pod now, and we can start to play around with pods, play around with the concept of pods. So he's going to stop the pods, and now we should see no pods running inside the uh, container, um, no pods left, and that's the end of the demo. And I think we're just to, we'll take a few questions. I think we're over time. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Is it possible to deny write and execute on memory? Yeah. Like, is there a security feature in which um, I can say, hey, I want to run this container, and it's like, and it's like, 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 it's like,
yeah, I, I, I don't know of any way in the kernel to do that. Uh, yeah. Yes? What's the difference between XFS and EXT4 and Ubuntu and Fedora? And it's just different ways of doing the same thing, right? There doesn't need to be only one way to run containers under Kubernetes. So they're competing projects. So we actually believe that Cryo is better. They believe that ContainerD is better. <laughs> Anybody, any other questions? Yes. So Garden Runtime Container is a, another competing project. I don't think it runs on the Kubernetes yet. That's part of Pivotal. So that's a different container runtime altogether. I don't know if they support OCI yet or not. Last question, yes. Yeah, go. You can, you can run Builder as non-root. So yes, you can run Builder inside of a user namespace inside of Kubernetes, yes. So I could run a bunch of containers doing Builders inside of Kubernetes, yeah. Can I safely alias Docker? Yes, I can alias Docker equals Podman and then I can do a Podman build, a Docker build and it will do a Podman build. So Builder is actually built into Podman for the Podman build capability. Yeah, okay, thank you for coming guys. Thank you.